Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as a parent of three, I'm not allowed to have favourites. But when it comes to dragonflies, I have two clear favourites, which will be the subject of the talk this afternoon. One is the scarce blue-tailed damselfly, and the second is downy emerald. Now, I was very pleased to hear Steve Jones's talk this morning because I spent a very memorable day with Steve in Cornwall over 30 years ago, visiting some of the sites that he spoke about this morning. And uh, it was very, very interesting to talk about the differences in the habitat types. Now, at the time, um, the name scarce meant that the scarce blue-tailed damselfly was regarded as a bit of a rarity and not very much was known about it. And it even had the name of the wandering opportunist because it was known to sort of suddenly turn up at a site and uh, then uh, disappear again. Now, like Steve, I also joined the BDS in 1983. And the following year, I attended the very first indoor meeting of the BDS, which was held at the Biological Record Centre at Monk's Wood. Now, at that time, Philip Corbett was the president. And I think it was fair to say that there was a very strong involvement from academia within the BDS at that time. And after the meeting, I was completely in awe of the amount of knowledge that was in that room. And I probably went away from the meeting thinking that everything that there was to know about British dragonflies had already been found out. And it was only in subsequent years I began to realise that there is probably still quite a lot that we can still get to know about British dragonflies. So I was involved in two projects and that's what I want to talk about this afternoon, because I think at the time I was probably what would be described as an enthusiastic amateur. And uh, so I set about an individual amateur project on the scarce blue tailed damselfly, which at the time I lived in just on the north edge of Luton. And within 10 minutes drive of my house, I had a really good site where scarce blue tailed damselfly had been discovered. The second project is to talk about a group project and show the value of working as a group on studying the downy emerald. So first of all, I want to talk about the scarce blue tailed damselfly. And back in 1975, the record had been rejected by the Biological Record Centre because a chalk quarry is the last place one would find Ishnura pumilio. Well, in 1987, Ishnura pumilio, the scarce blue-tailed damselfly, was found at two chalk quarries in Bedfordshire and one in Buckinghamshire. And I set about this individual project to try and understand the species habitat conditions in these chalk quarries, and also to assess the population size, and also try and ascertain the state of maturity of the female form or antiarca, which is the bright orange female uh, color form. Now at the time, the reason that the record was rejected is that scarce blue-tailed damselfly had been long associated with boggy runnels, typically places like the New Forest, sites in, Cam uh, in Pembrokeshire, and, and a few other areas. And so a chalk quarry was really quite different to all these boggy habitats. So as a regular visit to the New Forest, I took photographs back in 1989. And you can see on the left here is a habitat in the New Forest just outside Brockenhurst, where there was a very strong colony of scarce blue-tailed damselfly. And on the right, you've got the habitat at Sundon Quarry showing these seepages that were running out at the base of chalk cliffs and the water was collecting in the wheel ruts that were formed by off-road vehicles and motorbikes. Now one of the things that these sites have in common is that there is a lot of habitat disturbance. So in the New Forest you've got a lot of poaching by 
the ponies, cattle, deer, and also forestry operations. And at the bottom um, on the left are two photographs of Stockley enclosure, which is next to Round Hill campsite in the New Forest. And I saw this site evolve from being recently cleared to becoming one of the best sites in Britain for scarce blue-tailed damselfly. And there were literally hundreds of individuals uh, at, at this particular habitat. Similarly, at Sundon, the four-wheel drive vehicles and motorbikes were churning up the habitat, creating these lovely runnels, which were not that dissimilar to all the disturbance that was caused in the new forest. Now, what intrigued me at the time was that I had a very early copy of the Dragonflies of Great Britain and Ireland by Cyril Hammond. And I don't expect you to read all the detail here, but he clearly identified that with the, the, stat, the normal um, blue-tailed damselfly, there were various colour forms that matured into other colour forms as they aged. There was no mention of this for scarce blue-tailed damselfly, and it was still regarded that this orange female was a very distinct form and persisted throughout the life of the damselfly. Now, I started to sort of ask some questions because having counted the number of females at my site at Sundon, I was noticing that this bright orange female was very prevalent early on in the season, but gradually declined as the season progressed. And this just chart just shows that in black shows the numbers of the orange Orantiarca form that I was counting in 1992. So I decided that I would start to mark some of the individuals and I ended up marking nearly 200 individuals at Sundon. And I'd read this paper where somebody had used a dot pattern on the wings to, to mark the individuals. So I set about with marker pens, making various marks on, on the wings. And I didn't quite like the system that, that that previous author had used. So I started to use Roman numerals. And as you can see on the left here, there is a very good example, probably a, a one-off example of the system working very well because I'd marked two individuals, um, a female and a male, uh, sequentially. And then within about 10, 15 minutes, I discovered them actually copulating. So this was very encouraging for me because it made me realize that the marking was effective. It didn't alter their behavior. It didn't do any harm to them. And they were quite happy to go about their business uh, with the markings. So having marked individuals, and particularly the Orantiarca females, I then found that the colour was transitioning from the bright orange all the way through to the normal green form that we, um, a lot of us see. So the photograph in the middle shows this transitional phase where you can see the orange slowly disappearing from the abdomen and the thorax, before it becomes completely green as the um, color disappears. And through this marking, I was able to determine that it was a teneral for about a day. The Orantiarca form lasted between five and nine days, depending on the weather conditions. There was this intermediate form, which seemed to last for around two days. And then it became a mature female that would then last another 26 days. Now, these times did vary. And I, I guess with climate change and warming climates, some of these numbers might actually have changed by now. But that gave you a rough idea of the length of the life of an individual female. So just to summarise, the individuals emerge as a tenoral form where they lack any great coloring. They, they have this straw coloring. They then mature into the Orantiarca orange female. And you can see that really the orange gets very, very intense, particularly on the top of the abdomen and on the thorax. And notice behind the eyes, you get these very bright orange postocular spots. 
That then goes through this transitional color form. And these are recent photographs showing you how this color is disappearing. And you get a form where you've got the green beginning to show through, but you still retain those bright orange postocular spots. That will then become a really bright green orange female, sorry, green female, before then finally transitioning into the somewhat dull and well camouflaged dull green mature female. Now, what is interesting is that I've only ever seen these mature females ovipositing which suggests that they are fully mature at that stage. And I did read of some research where somebody had dissected an Orantiarca female and they'd only found unfertilized eggs. So it did appear to be that the Orantiarca form was in fact a, an immature transitional phase. Now, one of the things that was very intriguing is how long was the life cycle? And I had a great opportunity at Sundon because, because of the four wheel drive vehicles and the motorbikes, there was constant change to the habitat. And add on top of that, that the local car thieves from Luton would use Sundon Quarry to dump their um, discarded vehicles. So what I used to do is I used to go down to Sundon and I'd find where the water was coming out of the the, the chalk cliffs, and I would actually create a little seepage pool, which I knew had had no dragonfly or damselfly activity. And what I would do is I would watch for a female egg laying, and then I would transfer some of the stems that they were using for egg laying into my completely virgin seepage pool. And during the course of the, the next year, I was able to easily find larvae which were developing. And then the following year, I actually had, had them emerging and I could find the exuvia. Now, although the adult dragonflies are quite spectacular and very colorful, the, the larvae are actually quite bland. And if anyone wants a few pointers on their identification, you'll see that these two larvae, the one on the left, sir, very immature larvae. The one on the right is a mature larvae. The legs lack any banding and the caudal lamellae are somewhat smaller than what you would find in a normal blue-tailed damselfly. So I was quite confident that they were developing scarce blue-tailed and I was able to show beyond any doubt that it had a one-year life cycle. So the seepages in the chalk quarry do have a very similar habitat architecture to boggy runnels. But the marking revealed that there were many, many more individuals at the site than I was ever seeing at any one time. And I showed that the Orantiarca female was in fact just a transitional coloration rather than being a distinct form. And the marking also showed that it didn't affect any behavior in any way and that they had a one year life cycle. Now, if anyone's interested to follow up on this, you can actually download copies of the journal from the BDS website. And just a, a reference to the, um, the journal is on the screen now, but the story doesn't end here. And I think someone earlier mentioned about the Buckler's Forest site down near Crowthorne in Berkshire. And this is a photograph of the uh, scarce blue-tailed habitat at that site. Now, what is rather interesting is that these types of drainage systems are cropping up all over the country whenever there are developments, these so-called SUDS ponds or sustainable draining schemes. And these seem to me to be ideal habitat for scarce blue-tailed damselfly. So I would encourage everybody to keep an eye out and visit these sites and, and see if they can find it. So in terms of open questions, I was never able to really see what was happening with the Orantiarca females. And 
I would occasionally see a male in tandem with an Aurantiarca and even sometimes try and copulate with it. But I never really was sure whether that was successful. And I certainly never saw Aurantiarca females go on to oviposit. So I've put an appeal out here for photos are needed because it would be very, very interesting to see whether others can photograph Aurantiarca females in COP or ideally ovipositing. Another intriguing question is there is this blue form of the female, which is shown in the right hand side photograph. This photograph is courtesy of Ingrid Twizzle, who photographed this in the Forest of Dean. And to my knowledge, this blue female form has only ever been recorded in the Forest of Dean, a site in Norfolk and also Sussex. So there is a suggestion that these blue forms are migrants from the continent where it is more abundant. And it would be very, very interesting if we could find out more as to where these females are, are coming from or how they develop. So that finishes the, the blue tailed damselfly story. The next project I was involved with was a project with what was the North of London BDS group at the time. And there was a very, very interesting question raised as why did the Downy Emerald disappear after management work on the ponds in Epping Forest? <clears throat> now, the credit for this project has to go to Steve Brooks and Andy McGinney, who were the brainchilds and the driving force behind this project. But they did mobilize a group of us to get together and talk about the Downy Emerald and start to investigate what was going on with the disappearance in Epping Forest. Now, we had a very, very active group and we used to meet up. And I noticed that Andy McGinney is, is on the call today and also Val Perrin, who were members of the group. And we set about trying to understand the larval requirements at Epping Forest and also Burnham Beaches. We also wanted to assess the activity of the adults and see where they were going and how they were utilising the habitat. And finally, we wanted to ideally propose some recommendation for the future management of ponds elsewhere within the uh, Corporation of London's uh, uh, parks. So our main study site was Wake Valley Pond in Epping Forest. And the interesting thing was, is that you could go to this site and you could probably on a good day of weather conditions, you could see half a dozen downy emeralds flying around the margins of, of, of the lake. And what we started to do is between the group of us, we would have enough individuals going down there regularly, counting the number of emerging adults and counting the whereabouts of the exuvia and how many we, we found. And we were able to sustain this as a group for six years, which was quite phenomenal. And it uh, enabled us to investigate things that probably hadn't been uh, uncovered before then. Now, both Steve Brooks and myself both had growing families at the time, and we used to take our kids down with us and get them involved. And we found that searching for exuvia was by far the best way to assess the population size. And the photograph on the right uh, shows Steve Brooks hiding amongst the trees and his son Joe pointing to a downy emerald exuvia that had left the water and climbed up this rather unusual looking sort of branch of the, of the tree. The photograph on the left shows what looks like a sallow with a, an exuvia up in the branches. And my sons, with a very short uh, attention span, started to climb higher up into the trees. And we then got a shout saying, hey, dad, there are exuvia up in the trees. And we thought they were joking at the time, but there were indeed downy emerald exuvia way up in the branches of oak trees. So we had completely overlooked these as adults and we are eternally grateful for our children at the time for pointing out uh, these out to us. But as I say, we sustained this for over six, well, just over six years. And you'll see on the left, these are the number of exuvia that 
that we counted each year. And I think it's fair to say it was a very good way of assessing the population, but there were probably a number of factors going on here, one of which our experience at finding them was improving all the time. And by year six, we were finding well over 1,200 exuvia in one season, which was quite phenomenal. We also started to see that maybe they were alternating every other year in that some years were higher than than others. So there were other things going on. But you can see on the right, the map of which Andy McGinney drew shows where all the exuvia were found around the pond. And this was quite interesting because we thought at one time we would find more on the sunnier sides, but it appeared that it sort of evened out over the course of a season, but they did appear to favour those areas of the lake that got the early morning sun, which is the time that they, most of them would be, be emerging. The next thing we wanted to do is understand what was going on with the other adult activity. Now, the nice thing with Epping Forest is that the Wake Valley Pond was the main breeding site. But in the surrounding area, there were another number of other ponds, including various bomb craters that were formed during the, the Second World War, uh, when I think the Luftwaffe used to drop their surplus bombs over Epping on their way back to Germany to lighten the load. But what we would do is, again, we would take the family down and we would spend days trying to catch adult downy emeralds. And this photograph shows Steve and Joe Brooks and the workers, which was Anne Brooks with a net trying to catch these downy emeralds. Now, there was a reason for doing this, because, again, what we wanted to do is we wanted to mark them. So we were fortunate in we were able to catch and mark over 50 males and we were able to mark them with a series of dots on the wings, which was a combination of red, orange and yellow acrylic paint. And Andy came up with the marking scheme, which is showed on the schematic in the middle, that with a series of dots, um, we were able to identify individuals. And the photographs that are on the left show some early abortive attempts that we were trying to be too sensible by giving them numbers, a bit like I did with the scarce blue-tailed dam damselflies. But we then quickly realised that you can't read a number when they're flying around and hovering. We also tried the acrylic paint method and the early attempts, we ended up with just huge blodges on the wings. And we had to make sure that we refined our methods so that we could clearly dot the wings without causing um, too many problems of being able to see the numbering system. So what did this reveal? Well, Downy Emeralds spend a lot of time holding territories along the lake margin, and the resident males would always successfully defend their bays or their territories against rival males. We would also find that the males would occupy a territory for up to 27 minutes, which was quite surprising. And uh, on average, it was just over uh, 12 mi uh, minutes. So what we were finding is that the males were actually time sharing the lake and they would hold a territory which they would actively defend. And then they would leave the water in order to feed because they're basically they'd run out of energy. And the whole patrol area was density, density dependent. So the more males there were, the shorter the patrol length. The next thing that we wanted to try and ascertain is, well, where are the larvae living? And we had an idea that they were associated with, with leaf litter, but we would spend hours and hours trying to find larvae. And again, you can see Andy McGinney on the left and Adrian Hine on the right. Adrian had joined us and was also actively involved in looking at the, the Downy Emerald at Burnham Beaches on the, the west side of London. But it quickly became uh, obvious that searching for larvae was proving very, very difficult, particularly at the sites within the Corporation of uh, London area. So what we decided to do is that Andy and myself decided to go on a bit of a road trip and we visited a number of sites in southern 
England, where we knew Downey Emerald was to uh, was present. And it was not until we found um, a site down in Berkshire that we were able to find good numbers of Downy Emerald uh, larvae. So you can see Andy on the right here with my son at the time. And we were literally pulling out netfuls of leaf litter and then going through the, the, the leaf litter, finding the larvae. And then on the little inset on the right hand side, you'll see that Andy is actually measuring the head width and the body length of each larvae. And we were recording that uh, over the, uh, the course of a year. And this was the sort of thing that we were finding that this is a photograph looking down into the water at this particular site in Berkshire. And you can see the bank on the right, and then the water dips into uh, an area that is just literally leaf litter only. And then the water gets deeper. And as you go to the left, you can see that it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, what we were finding is that this area of leaf litter was absolutely crawling with the larvae of Downy Emerald, which was much to our amazement because we'd not found this at any other site. So we started to measure these and we found some quite interesting things. We took, we had three really good sessions where we were able to capture larvae, measure them, and then release them at the end. But as you can see from this chart, which is on one of the sampling uh, uh, meetings in October, it proved very, very difficult to find small larvae. And if you think about it in terms of the population dynamics, the small larvae would be in much greater abundance than at any other stage, but we just simply weren't finding them. And I think through our best efforts, we found one on during October. But it did show that the, the population was breaking up into different cohorts, and we were trying to ascertain as to what, um, what was going on here. But we did find that there were also no tiny larvae in the July samples, which wasn't you know it was not unsurprising because during july this is just after they've been egg laying so you wouldn't expect to, to find any we also found that there was no larval growth over the winter period so if we compared october with when we were sampling in april the cohorts hadn't changed a great deal we also looked I think it was in January where we didn't find any larvae at all in these really good areas. So the larvae were just disappearing in the winter. So we were almost certain that they were actually migrating into the deeper water. And what was interesting at the time is that we were actually finding a lot more of the what you would regard as dragonfly larvae prey in that leaf litter, things like uh, bloodworms and coronamid uh, larvae. So it was really interesting to find that out. Now, apologies to you, Andy, if you're still on the call, but um, capturing and marking larvae is very, very hard work and it's quite tiring. And during the, the lunch times, we did need a bit of a rest. But there is a serious point to be made by this photograph because Andy was really great to go out with during these visits because we bounced so many ideas off of each other that we were always challenging each other with sort of silly questions. And I would certainly encourage anybody that's sort of studying dragonflies or getting together with another group of people is keep bombarding each other with questions and trying to challenge each other as to why we think this and why we think that about our British species. And I think through those conversations, which I will always remember with great fondness, we were able to almost predict where we could see and where we could find uh, downy emerald larvae. So what were the product findings? Well, I've already said that we, we found that males would patrol for up to 27 minutes with an average of 12.75 uh, minutes before they left the, the, the water. Resident males that were familiar with their territory would always defend their territories and successfully against rivals. The hovering flight of the downy emerald was energetically expensive and males literally had to leave to just replenish their uh, energy resources and that those patrol areas were density dependent. 
But again, like with the scarce blue-tailed damselfly, the marking revealed that there were many, many more adults present at any one time than, than we were actually seeing, and that they were in fact time-sharing. We also concluded that recording exuvia is still one of the best ways to evaluate and reveal the true size of the population, and that the larvae were favouring areas of coarse plant debris and leaf litter. And certainly we were never finding larvae where the substrate was of a much finer material. And finally, and the most important thing to conserve the species, we were able to make the recommendation to the Corporation of London uh, not to uh, clear out their ponds with so much vigour during their management operations and particularly not removing the leaf litter. And again, the, the article that covers the time sharing in the main male downy emerald can be downloaded from one of the journals on the BDS website. So I think projects have got a great deal of merit in terms of enabling us and anybody to get involved to study dragonflies and find out more about them. And another project I started, but I didn't quite get any further forward with, was a lot of us have garden ponds with southern hawkers visiting them. It's actually very easy to mark the wings of southern hawkers, even when they're egg laying by your pond. You just have a, a brush on the end of a bamboo cane dip the tip of the brush in paint, and then you can sneak up on them and you can paint dots on their wings quite happily without affecting their behavior. And they'll fly off and come back to the pond. So there, there's a challenge for anyone out there who wants to pick this up to try marking Southern Hawkers because it's quite, quite an interesting project. So finally, in conclusion, I think BDS members as amateur naturalists have a lot of opportunities to contribute to our further knowledge and understanding of British dragonflies. And I would encourage people to, if you have the interest, to use marking as a, a useful tool to investigate further and see how many thing, how many dragonflies are visiting your site. And there are lots of things still to discover, and we should all still keep asking lots and lots of questions. And you can do this as either individuals or group projects. And I think you will find that this type of project work can be addictive and is fun. And I would strongly recommend that you get started now in the coming season. So thank you for listening. Thank you.